hopefully you all know who I am. Um, and I, I don't know whether you know very much about me at all, but uh, I'm a retired teacher. I taught at Oxford Public Schools and taught second grade and that for 34 years in Oxford and then I taught four years for the Derby Public School System. So I taught and I've only taught second grade. So when I substitute, I'm getting a little bit different thing here going on and kindergartners are just a different breed of child. <laughs> they truly are. And my grandson, my youngest grandson happens to be in that kindergarten class, so he was I kind of embarrassed him today because I put him on the spot to, and said, "Well, what do you usually call me?" And he's kind of like Oh gosh, you know. And he said grandma and I said, "Okay, so if you hear him call me grandma or if you slip and call me grandma, it's okay. I'm not going to worry about it." And that, but um, I'm married. I had two children. Both my kids live over here, but my grandkids either go to school in in Oxford or they go to school. I have one in school at Dexter and that, but the other 3 4 are in school at, at Oxford and they've always gone to school there and that. So I have uh, oldest grandsons in college down at Cali. He's a sophomore this year and our oldest granddaughter is in the Navy and um, she's, I'm not real sure where she's at. She was back in August and was to go to Pensacola she gets to Pensacola and goes to New Orleans, and now she's from New Orleans going back to Pensacola to load up to go somewhere else because of the hurricane coming. So I don't know what's going on there. That's the Navy's problem. <laughs> and uh, she's almost two years in the Navy now, and, uh, but, uh, and she likes it pretty well. It's been a blessing for her. I have put over here, and I'm just going to walk over here since I have a microphone on. This picture right here is the Battle of Chippewa, and it was at the center. I knew we had some pictures down there, and so I looked, and this is one of the battles from the War of 1812, and that. Um, this is the Stars and Stripes that was flying at Fort McHenry when, there's a picture, a uh, poster of it, when, um, Francis Scott Key wrote the Star Spangled Banner. This flag now, this flag is still in existence. It is huge. It is a huge flag. Um, I was reading this at the bottom. Uh, let's see. It is 30 by 42 feet. So this is a huge flag. It does hang in the Smithsonian Museum of American History in Washington, D.C. It is not always out for the public to view. It's on a roller that they roll up, and then at certain times of the day, they will bring it down so people can see it. And, that, and I have had the opportunity to see that flag, and it does look like this. You can see it's pretty tattered here, and that. So it is still in existence from the War of 1812, and, and that. And the backside, and it's not a very good picture, but it shows the fort. And luckily, a few years ago, my husband and I went on a business trip and we got to go to Fort McHenry and tour the fort and, and that. So it's a pretty interesting place to go. And I brought, I had about three pictures from there. This is one of the cannons that's outside the fort. There are several others. And then this was in the barracks and that, the, the bunks where they stayed and, and everything. This one here, if I'm not mistaken, this is Old Ironsides. I can't read what it says on there and I didn't write it on the back. Shame on me. I know better now. Okay. At the beginning of the 19th century, Great Britain was involved in a bitter, long conflict with France and Napoleon Bonaparte. France and Britain, trying to cut off supplies from each other, were also blockading the United States, attacking their ships and taking sailors as prisoners and keeping them from getting 
to European shores to sell and buy goods. And I need to turn on the overhead here. This is the Northern Campaign. And then on June 18th of 1812, President James Madison signed a declaration of war against Great Britain. Thus began the Second War with Great Britain. The Americans wanted to move and settle in the West peacefully, and they wanted the freedom to sail the seas without problems from Great Britain. But because the Brits occupied much of Canada and had made allies with the Indians, it didn't look as if a peaceful move west was going to happen, and the Brits were the best of the best at sea. The war started in the backwoods of the Old Northwest. Chief Tecumseh, a well-respected and well-known chief, kept reminding the Indians that the Americans' westward movement was not good for them. My goodness, did he have insight. He and his brother, Lalawithika, or the prophet, organized the tribes to block the Americans' push west. In 1811, William Henry Harrison was territorial governor of the Indian, Indiana Territory, and to stop the Indian Confederacy, he led his men from Vincennes and camped about a mile from the village, which was on Tippecanoe Creek. And Tippecanoe Creek is right down here. But the Indians made a surprise attack at dawn. The Americans prevailed and drove the Indians back to the village, and the Americans then destroyed the village. This made Harrison famous. He was elected President of the United States in 1840, and his campaign slogan was Tippecanoe and Tyler too. The war was fought mainly in the west and northwest near the western end of Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. And let's see, these areas here. Okay, those are the areas. The first drive was led by General William Hull, who was dashing in the Revolution, but now was timid and cautious. Instead of striking Fort Malden on the Canadian side, he waited. This allowed British General Brock to assemble a fighting force of Canadians, British, and Indians. Brock moved across the river and cut Hull's communications with Ohio and then laid siege to Detroit. General Brock wanted Hull to surrender, but Hull, not wanting any of the women or the children hurt, was not sure what to do. A shot from a British ship solved the problem. It landed in the city and killed two men. So on August 16th of 1812, Hull raised the flag of truce and surrendered. He was later court-martialed and sentenced to death for cowardice and neglect of duty. The sentence was never carried out. He was dropped from army rolls instead. So the British were successful in taking all the American territory north and west of Ohio after only two months of war. So the British had taken most of this in here. And that Fort Malden is right there, is the fort they're talking about. <clears throat> The first year was disastrous to the Americans. They did not have a properly trained army and had poor leadership. Their victories were non-existent and they could not invade enemy soil successfully. But there were victories at sea. The British were best at fighting at sea. They had not been defeated on the high seas for many years, but the Americans astounded them. The American victories could be credited to their ability to fight well in close quarters, their accurate marksmanship, and their crews, which were better trained. On August 19, 1812, Captain Isaac Hull's ship, the Constitution, which had 44 guns, shocked the British by fighting and sinking the frigate Guerrier off Nova Scotia. Thus began the Constitu Constitution's successful campaign at sea. Her next victory was against the British frigate Java, off the coast of Brazil. Her successes in battle led her to be nicknamed Old Ironsides, although ironclad vessels were not used in naval warfare until the Civil War. A frigate was a three-masted sailing warship of medium size and could probably move very fast in the water. Ship for ship, the Americans trounced the British in the first year of the war. In 1814, the British succeeded in blockading New England and used Chesapeake Bay for their naval station, thus making it very difficult to import goods to the United States. This, in turn, forced the U.S. to begin manufacturing their own goods. 
Don't give up the ship was the battle cry of the American Navy. This was originally uttered by the dying commander of the Chesapeake, Commander James Lawrence. The British frigate Shannon got the best of the Chesapeake, and as the British were boarding the ship, Lawrence told the crew, don't give up the ship, but it was too late. The Chesapeake was captured and taken to Halifax. Commander Lewis's, Lawrence's words were to become the battle cry of the American Navy. In April 1813, the Americans, led by General Henry Dearborn with 1,700 men, sailed up Lake Ontario. He arrived at York, which is now Toronto. I'll switch maps here. Oh, wrong one. Here it is. Here's York, Toronto. Sorry about that. Where his men seized the fort, this fort lay midway between the landing and the town. As the Americans pushed through the fort, a powder magazine or a mine exploded, killing Americans and British. Brigadier General Zebulon Pike, of Pike's Peak fame, was killed there too. The Americans looted, burned, and destroyed many of the town's buildings and the town records. A week later, later General Dearborn took his troops across Lake Ontario and joined Colonel Winfield Scott at Niagara to fight on the Canadian side of the river. So they traveled from here and went down here to Fort Niagara. So they crossed Lake Ontario. The Americans knew that to regain control of Detroit, which was lost by General Hull, they had to control Lake Erie. 28-year-old Captain Oliver Hazard Perry was ordered to oversee the building of a fleet and to seize control of the lake. By August of 1813, he was ready. He sailed up the lake and anchored at Put-in Bay, where on September 10th, he engaged the British fleet. The Brits' guns had a longer range and soon had battered Perry's flagship, the Lawrence. His officers were dead or wounded, but he refused to give up. At the height of the battle, Perry got in a small boat and rowed to the Niagara. He managed to bring her around and aim her powerful guns at the two British ships. Soon the British had surrendered. It had taken only 15 minutes to turn what seemed to be a defeat into a victory and gain control of Lake Erie. On the back of an envelope, Perry wrote this mes message to General Harrison. Dear General, we have met the enemy and they are ours. Two ships, two brigs, one schooner, and one sloop. Yours with great respect and esteem, O.H. Perry. And I'm sure you've all heard that we have met the enemy and they are ours statement. And that's who originated it. By early 1814, Napoleon Bonaparte had been overthrown and England could now throw all of her efforts and strength into this war with the United States. 14,000 troops were sent across the Atlantic. The British plan was one, thrust south into New York State through Lake Champlain, two, move against Washington and Baltimore from Chesapeake Bay, and three, seize New Orleans and control the Mississippi River. But the Americans were now better prepared. The army had increased and incompetent generals had been replaced. The Americans under J General Jacob Brown invaded Canada again and seized Fort Erie. General Winfield Scott and General Brown joined forces and defeated the British. The Battle of Chippewa, picture back there, was also a turning point. After this battle, no force of U.S. regulars were defeated by the British Army, but the invasion of Canada got nowhere. The Americans held Fort Erie, but the Brits laid siege. The Americans managed to hold on and the British retreated. The Americans then destroyed the fort and gave up the drive to take Canada. That's why we don't have Canada. This war was instrumental in us not having Canada. It's what kept us in what we now know as the United States and Canada in Canada. And that, because as you can see, a lot of this is up in the Canadian part at that time. In September 1814, the British commander, Sir George Prevost, and his troops outnumbered the Americans four to one at Plattsburgh, New York. The Americans knew they had to control Lake Champlain or the British would invade. Captain Thomas MacDonald commanded four ships and ten gunboats. 
He arranged them so his powerful short-range guns would do the most damage to the British ships. He anchored his ships in the narrow channel between Crab Island and Cumberland Head, across from Plattsburgh. The Battle of Lake Champlain lasted two hours and 20 minutes. All the British vessels, except for the gunboats, were seized or destroyed. Sir George's aide-de-camp told him they had struck, meaning the British flags had been lowered. It was a great victory for the Americans, who now controlled Lake Champlain. Yeah, down at the bottom, in the corner. You're right. Okay. And here's Plattsburgh. Let me scoot that up. And, that, and this is the battle where they were able to keep that. And then they beat, beat the British there and got control of the lake. The burning of Washington. I think you all heard about Washington, D.C. being burned and the White House burned to the ground. Well, this is it. This is the war it happened in. In August 1814, the British fleet, along with 4,000 veteran troops, moved up Chesapeake Bay to the mouth of the Patuxent River in Maryland. They landed without incident and marched to the capital. General William H. Winder tried to stop the British troops at Bladensburg, but he and his men were rousted by the Brits. The British proceeded and entered Washington just as President Madison and other government officials fled. The British set fire to the Capitol, the White House, and other government buildings. Secretary of War Armstrong went into hiding and was later forced to resign. The heroine of this night was the President's wife, Dolly Madison. She managed to gather up many valuable state papers and a portrait of George Washington before fleeing the White House. The British now moved on to Baltimore. So they had come up here, and now here's where Washington is, and they're going to move on over into the Baltimore area, because that's, a, again, a big seaport. But General Samuel Smith had prepared the city for war. He had an army of 13,000 regulars and militia, and there was a mixed force of, force of men at Fort McHenry. The Americans had sunk a line of ship hulls to keep the British from sailing into the harbor. The British came by land, but the Americans held them back. Next, they tried to invade by sea and launched a bombardment against the fort. On the deck of a ship at anchor in the river was a young lawyer named Francis Scott Key. He watched all night as the British bombarded the fort, but by 7 a.m., the Brits ceased fire and the Stars and Stripes was still flying over Fort McHenry, though it was a bit tattered. He was so thrilled by the troops' defense of the fort, he jotted down some notes for a song. He wrote the song to the tune of To Anna's Crean in Heaven, originally sung during the time of the Revolutionary War. Key's brother-in-law, Judge Joseph Hopper Nicholson liked it so much, he sent the poem to a printer. It was originally printed under the name The Defense of Fort McHenry, but later became The Star-Spangled Banner. The British had been defeated on land and sea, and so left the Chesapeake Bay in October and sailed to Jamaica. The War in the South, Victory in New Orleans. On the eve of the war, and this goes back to the beginnings of the war in 1812, Chief Tecumseh visited the Creek Indians in Alabama country. A war party of Creeks, called Red Sticks because of their weapons, set fire to the southern frontier. In 1813, the Indians attacked Fort Mims, south or north of Mobile, Alabama, and massacred close to 500 people in the fort. Major General Andrew Jackson, who was in Nashville, called for 2,000 volunteers. He moved into Creek Territory and proceeded to defeat the Creeks in the Cherokee at Horseshoe Bend on the Tallapoosa River. And here's Horseshoe Bend. And I am assuming this little squiggly line must be that river. It isn't marked, but that must be that Tallapoosa River. There's Fort Mims here. Andrew Jackson was recognized by those in Washington as a great soldier and was given command of the U.S. Army in the Southwest. 
In November 1814, a large British fleet with 7,500 veteran soldiers sailed from Jamaica to attack New Orleans and seize control of the Mississippi River. The fleet entered Lake Borne, 40 miles east of New Orleans, and marched to within seven miles of the city. Jackson and his troops moved quickly. On December 23rd, he led 5,000 troops in a night attack on the British. Casualties were heavy on both sides. Jackson pulled back and waited for the enemy. On January 8th of 1815, Sir Packingham attacked, but Jackson's 4,500 men were from Kentucky and were crack shots. In 30 minutes, Sir Packingham and his men were defeated. He and two other British generals were killed, and 2,000 of his troops were either wounded or killed. Jackson lost eight men, and 13 were wounded. The British sailed for home. The Battle of New Orleans was America's greatest land victory of the war, but little at the time did either side know the war had ended two weeks before. Two weeks before. Peace talks had begun in August of 1814 in the town of Ghent in Flanders. The U.S. peace commissioners were John Q. Adams, Henry Clay, and Albert Galatian. Talks did not go well, and each side ended giving up their claims against each other. Neither side gained or kept any of the land they had captured, and all prisoners from each side were sent back to their respective countries. The Treaty of Ghent brought peace to these two great nations, and it allowed the U.S. and Canada to work together along their mutual borders, and the U.S. and England became strong allies. They had signed this peace treaty two weeks before the Battle of New Orleans, and if you remember, this is the 1800s, so communications were by ship or horseback or whatever. So, and since they had done the peace treaty in um, England, that's why it took so long for him to find out. The War of 1812 is not remembered very well, and most history books don't have a whole lot about it, but it was very important to the Canadians and to the Amer Native Americans. They saw it as a turning point in their losing struggle to govern themselves. It did have a far-reaching impact for the United States, as the Treaty of Ghent ended decades of infighting and partisanship in the government. It ushered in the era of good feeling, and the Federalist Party was ousted. The war also boosted the U.S. self-confidence and encouraged the spirit of expansionism in the United States. This, in turn, would help shape the better part of the 19th century. But I got some pictures off the internet of some of these famous people that um, were instrumental in this war. And one, of course, is James Madison, who's at the top in the center, and that he was the fourth president of the United States from 1809 to 1817, He's hailed as the father of the Constitution and the key author of the Bill of Rights. He was married to Dolly, <coughs> excuse me, Payne Todd, who was 17 years younger than her husband. They had no children of their own, and they were married for 42 years. William Henry Harrison is the bottom corner here, was the ninth president. He served only 32 days in office. He was the first president to die in office. His term was from March through April of 1841. He was the oldest president at 68 years and 23 days to take office until President Reagan took office. He was the last president born before the U.S. Declaration of Independence, and his death sparked a brief constitutional crisis until the 25th Amendment was passed. He died of pneumonia, brought on by giving his inaugural speech in bitter cold and rainy weather. He talked for hours, and then I guess that goes to show you shouldn't talk so much. <laughs> he also served the shortest term of any U.S. president. He was the first presidential candidate to have a campaign slogan, Tip a Canoe and Tyler Too. Andrew Jackson, who was the seventh president, he's in the middle at the bottom, was pre um, president from 1829 to 1837. He was an Indian fighter and fought on the frontiers of Tennessee. He defeated the Creeks at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend in 1814 and the British at New Orleans in 1815. Jackson was named O. Hickory because of his toughness and aggressive personality. He fought many duels, some of which were fatal to his opponent. He initiated ethnic cleansing and forced the relocation of Native American tribes from the southwest 
to west of the Mississippi, the Trail of Tears, and his followers created the modern Democratic Party. I'm not sure I'd be very proud of that Trail of Tears part, but, oops, is that the one I want? Nope. Ah. General Winfield Scott never served as president, although he ran against and lost to Franklin Pierce in the general election of 1852 or 1853. He's in the bottom corner over here. He was a popular national figure and was promoted the rank of Lieutenant General in 1856, the first American since Ger George Washington to hold that rank. He was nicknamed Old Fuss and Feathers and Grand Old Man of the Army. Scott served on active duty as a general longer than any other man in U.S. history. He served on the Niagara Campaign in the War of 1812. He took command of the landing party at the Battle of Queenston Heights in Canada. He was captured and held prisoner by the British, but was released in a prisoner exchange. He fought at Fort George, Chippewa, and Lundy's Lane during the War of 1812. He was severely wounded at Lundy's Lane, but recovered. He later fought in the Second Seminole War and the Creek War in 1836 and helped supervise the removal of the Indians from the southeast to west of the Mississippi. General Scott is one of few U.S. Army generals to be honored on a postage stamp. He was the first to be honored after George Washington. His stamp was released to the public in 1870, four years after his death at West Point where he is also buried. And I think you know a local town that's named after the gentleman. Winfield, Kansas. So they're named Winfield after General Scott. And let's see. Francis Scott Key is there on the left, and Dolly Madison at the top on the right. And the gentleman, the Native American up there, that's Gen Chief Tecumseh. He lived from 1768 to 1813. Quite, quite the dresser, wasn't he? And then the uh, USS Constitution in Boston Harbor in 2005. And then and I'm going to read you a little background about the old, old Ironsides. This is a nickname given to the 18th century frigate, the US Constitution during the War of 1812, after its naval battle with the HMS Guerrier. The Constitution was one of the original six frigates of the United States Navy, commissioned by the Naval Act of 1794. The Constitution was the third of four ships with 44 guns and granted its name by President George Washington. The ships saw action during the Quasi War, the First Barbary War, the Battle of Tripoli Harbor, and the Battle of Dern before earning her famous nickname during the War of 1812. And I have a poem written by Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. about on September 16th of 1830 as a tribute to the 18th century frigate, the USS Constitution. And thanks in part to this poem, she was saved from being decommissioned and is now the oldest commissioned ship in the world still afloat. <coughs> and yes, you can go to Boston Harbor and see her. And here is the poem he wrote. I tear her tattered ensign down, long has it waved on high, and many an eye has danced to see that banner in the sky. Beneath it rung the battle shout and burst the cannon's roar. The meteor of the ocean air shall sweep the clouds no more. Her deck, once red with heroes' blood, where knelt the vanquished foe, when winds were hurrying over the flood and waves were white below. No more shall feel the victor's tread or know the conquered knee, the harpies of the shore shall pluck the eagle of the sea. Oh, better that her shattered hulk should sink beneath the wave. Her thunders shook the mighty deep, and there should be her grave. Nailed to the mast her holy flag, set every threadbare sail, and give her to the god of storms, the lightning and the gale. And his poem was instrumental in saving the ship. I think if they had decommissioned the ship, they'd have probably been torn apart and scuttled and that. And that's all I have. Does anyone have any questions? Gosh, I hope not, because I don't know the answers. <laughs> <laughs>
you want to turn one of the lights on? Yeah. Thank you. I happened to hear on the news over the summer that it was the 200th anniversary of the War of 1812, and I went, oh my goodness, I didn't know that. And I'm kind of a history nut, so I thought, well, I'll just see what I could find out about it. 